The way I like to explain a quantum computer is imagine that you meet a really hot girl, stacking modalities. Like Microsoft has a technology called MatterNet, and it's a, a simulation framework. It's almost like Reality Builder, uh, where you just tell it what properties you want. Like, I want a battery, you know? So, <laughs> so, so that's quantum computing in a nutshell. And so in many cases, to use a post-quantum algorithm, the key sizes are 10 to 100 times greater. Let's say I want a Black Hawk helicopter, and, and I want the skin to have what's called a negative refractory index material so it can go invisible. And Does quantum computing, would that make cryptocurrency irrelevant? No, no. So basically how a quantum computer works is um, it's an augmentation of classical computing, not a replacement of it. So the way I like to explain a quantum computer is imagine that you meet a really hot girl and she wants to give you her number, but she's kind of a bitch. So she's like, all right, I wrote my number in this library over there inside one of the books. You walk in the library, there's millions of books, and you're like, oh, fuck you. So she's legit, she wrote her number in there, but like, how do you find the number? So a classical computer, how that would work is that you would just start at one of the bookshelves, you take each book off, and you flip through all the pages and see if you find the number. Now, if you want to speed it up, there's two ways you can speed it up. You can speed it up sequentially, meaning that you speed up the rate at which you flip through the books, or in parallel, and in parallel, you get your friends to go and help look through. So maybe you have five guys come, so you and five other guys are flipping through books. Now you have six cores running. And if you want to sequentially, that's your clock rate, you speed it up. So for a long, long time, since the 30s, when we first started talking about these things to today, that's been the paradigm of computing, is either speed up the clock rate or make it more parallel and find algorithms that can do that. Quantum computing is fundamentally different. What it does is it says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We have three things. We're going to do superposition. So we're instead of looking for the books, we're going to have this magical way of taking all the books off the shelves and put them in a superposition state. And then we have interference and entanglement. And these properties allow us to, relatively speaking, know the location, the rough location of where that book is. Then we'll put them all back on the shelves, but the area that has the number, we're gonna pull those books out slightly. So you still have to do the classical thing. You still have to go and open the book and read through the pages, but now instead of blindly going through and looking at all the different possibilities, you know the rough area that you want to go to. So you go over there, you pull that book off, and lo and behold, the number's there. You get laid, congratulations, life is good. You know, so 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 that's quantum computing in a nutshell. And 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 if you look at a lot of things that we do, you are trying in computing to stumble upon the right answer. Like flight scheduling. You're just like, well, how do I figure out this flight so that I can have a layover of this property in Atlanta and this, this and this? But there's all these other things going on and and it turns out it's like a, an NP problem. It's super hard to actually schedule a flight. But if you have a quantum computer, it can kind of look at all the art of the possible and at least give you a sense of where a probabilistic minimum is. So to minimize the layover time or whatever your objective is. Or in the case of large language models like ChatGPT or any of these AI things, what you'll do is you'll say, okay, well, there's outputs that come out of these models. Well, which one of the outputs is the right output? You'll ask it a question. You'll be like... Uh, you know, I need to know I'm going to be in D.C. for the weekend, uh, and here are all my parameters, uh, and, and I'm looking for a good restaurant, uh, and which one's a good one? And so they'll have maybe, maybe 50 recommendations that come through. And some are obviously wrong, like one's in Virginia or one's in Maryland or something, and one's really in D.C., but it's too expensive or something like that. So ordinarily what you'd have to do is you'd have to create some sort of system that's intelligent to look through all those different things. And a human being has to write that, a program, or you personally have to look at the outputs and say, oh, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. With a quantum computer, you basically get to look at all the outputs, just like all the books at the same time. And then it can show you which one of those answers is right. And remember, it could be millions of them. It's the qubit range. And so, you know, once you start getting up in qubits, you can do as arbitrarily many, like... And so what this does is it gives you the ability to have a large language model that's exponentially better than a large language model that we have today. Um, and it gets really crazy when you start stacking modalities. Like Microsoft has a technology called MatterNet, and it's a, a simulation framework. It's almost like Reality Builder, uh, where you just tell it what properties you want. Like, I want a battery, and I want these properties, and it basically gives you a recipe for how to make that molecularly. But the problem is that the simulation breaks down after you start modeling maybe 20, 30 electrons. 
Uh, so with a quantum computer, it doesn't have that limitation. You can look at many, many, many different bonding paths and things. So it literally can print out how to make that material that's magical. And so you could start talking about like, let's say I want a Black Hawk helicopter and, and I want the skin to have what's called a negative refractory index material so it can go invisible and, and I want it to be light but super strong and I want it to be self-healing so if I run an electrical current, the, the, the stress fractures heal themselves so I don't have to replace the airframe. And then also I want it to be non-Newtonian so that it's uh, soft but when it gets hit by a bullet, it gets super hard like a football helmet or something like that. And it'll tell you literally the recipe for how to make that strange exotic alloy, you know, wow. with all these different properties. You can't do that with a classical computer because there's uh, there's too many possibilities, and it's like a library with more books than the time of the universe to look at. But with a quantum computer, it can look at all of them at the same time. So it'll tell you the path to get to that and this specific recipe. Because right now, how we figured out is just math and trial and error. You go to a lab and you kind of do some stuff and you think, I think it's over here. And then you do a bunch of experiments until you stumble across the material. And everything works this way. It's like this microphone, what would give it the best sound? Or like a battery, you know, I want it to have a high energy density and I want it to be very light and I want it to charge really fast and I want it to be recyclable and be made out of non-rare earth materials because China owns all those and they're screwing us. Like I want to be able to make it domestically in America. That's a very rare intersection point of trade-offs. And so what material would you need to be able to do something like that? So when you blend these two things together, it's just going to create a golden age. We're, oh, we're going to be able man. to do things that are incredible. How close are we to that, do you think? Well, yeah, and the, sorry, I was on a tangent there, but um, you asked a specific question, like, will that kill the cryptocurrency industry? So in addition to these magical things that quantum computers can do, the defense issue is that most of the cryptography, public key cryptography that we use, has two parts to it, a public part and a private part. And the public part you give to everybody. And the private part you have. So in cryptocurrencies, you have private key and a public key. Public key is where I pay you. And the private keys, you know, what I use to authorize a payment. So the challenge is that all the math that's behind it in the classical sense, it, it only works as long as you don't have a quantum computer. If you have a quantum computer, you have things like Grover's algorithm and Shor's algorithm and these things and these gigabrains at MIT were basically able to show how to use this librarian book trick to find your private key inside the system because you can't find it normally. It'd be like looking for that phone number and going through mm -hmm. book after book after book. So the question is, are we done? No, because it turns out that there's algorithms that are not susceptible to this. They're called post-quantum cryptography. Um, so the challenge in why the cryptocurrency industry has not adopted them is kind of twofold. One is that they're new and highly inefficient. So in many cases, to use a post-quantum algorithm, the key sizes are 10 to 100 times greater. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.